The second lesson from God's Word today, from St. Paul's first letter to the Thessalonians, chapter 1, the first five verses. Paul, Silas, and Timothy, to the church of the Thessalonians in God, the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, grace and peace to you. We always thank God for all of you and continually mention you in our prayers. We remember before our God and Father your work produced by faith, your labor prompted by love, and your endurance inspired by hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. For we know, brothers and sisters, loved by God, that he has chosen you because our gospel came to you, not simply with words, but also with power, with the Holy Spirit and deep conviction. This too is the word of our God. Hallelujah. Grace and peace from God the Father and from Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. You heard the words of the text already, the second lesson. I'll just read the first verse again. Paul, Silas, and Timothy, to the church of the Thessalonians in God, the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, grace and peace to you. In the name of our Lord Jesus, my dear fellow redeemed. This month, a lot of people in the Gulf states faced uncertainties. The threats of Hurricane Michael came out early. But exactly where was it going to strike? How strong was it going to be? Until it actually happened, no one knew. And as it turned out, the storm intensified more than anybody thought that it would. It was devastating where it struck. Now some of the productions were right on. But you know how that is. Now of course that's not the only uncertain thing. There are uncertainties in so many other areas of life. There's even uncertainties at times in our congregation. Questions, for example. And you faced a lot of them last week in your meeting. What are we going to do about the damage in the building? The roof, the carpet. What about the seating? Are we going to remove that and replace it? And of course, what does all this do to our building project with the school? So many uncertainties. What will the cost be? When will it be done? The Apostle Paul faced uncertainties too. He had gone to the city of Thessalonica on his second missionary journey. He spent a few weeks there and then he was forced to leave because of opposition from some of the Jewish people, his own countrymen. He wondered, what's happening? Is there even a church left there with the persecutions that are coming? And so he sent Timothy, his young co-worker, to go back and to find out just what the situation was. And Timothy went and he sent back, brought back a good report. Things were going well, far beyond what they had expected. And this prompted St. Paul to write this first letter to the Christians in Thessalonica, which possibly was the first letter that he wrote to a Christian congregation. At most, it probably was the second, but it was one of the earliest letters. And it was an encouraging letter for these Christians, and it is for us today, too. As St. Paul reminded them and reminds us, Christians face the future with confidence. They do so grateful for blessings received, joyful in the present, and eager to serve. St. Paul wrote, his co-workers, Silas and Timothy, concurred in what he wrote. He wrote with gratitude for how things were 
in Thessalonica. Even though he was no longer there, he was still concerned about those who had come to faith. He still loved them and cared about them. And the faith that they had in Jesus, their Savior from sin, in his regular prayers he noted, I always thank God for you. In his regular daily prayers. Now there may have been some difficult times, as there often are, and some difficult people there, but even for them, he thanks God, gave thanks in his prayers. And as he thanked God, he wanted them likewise to give thanks to the Lord God. And there were good reasons to do that. He reminded them, we know, brothers and sisters, loved by God, that he has chosen you. Just think about that. In eternity already, God had chosen those people to be his, to come to faith, to be children of God and heirs of eternal life and health. And so they can thank God, even in the uncertain times, with opposition from some of the Jews living there, and other people for that matter too. They can thank God for the faith that they now have, for the certainty that they have. You remember, many of those people perhaps were Gentiles. They had grown up worshiping the so-called gods and goddesses of the Greek, who supposedly lived on Mount Olympus, which was not very far away from Thessalonica. But now they knew the one true God. They knew that he chose them to be his own dear children. They didn't have to worry about making things right between them and God, as if they could anyway. But they knew that things were right because God had made them right through his son Jesus, our Savior. And Paul reminded them that was the case. As he wrote, our gospel came to you, not simply with words, but with power, with the Holy Spirit, and with deep conviction. As he and his companions preached the gospel, the Holy Spirit wasn't sitting back and saying, well, let's see what he can do. The Holy Spirit was at work among them too. And he's the one who worked in their hearts and in their minds and brought them to faith in Jesus as their Savior. He changed them from those who lived wicked lifestyles to those who wanted to walk with God. And why do I say wicked lifestyles? Well, remember, Thessalonica was a port, a seaport city. And you know, seaport cities often have a bad reputation, don't they? I mean, the sailors have been out at sea for who knows, weeks, months, and when they come to shore, they're going to have a good time. And that's not only them, but others for that matter too. But God had changed them into believers in the one true and living God. He had brought them to faith in their lives and kept them in that faith. And now they were willing to live as Christians, not ashamed to live as such, even in the midst of those wicked people in that city. And so the apostle thanked God for those blessings that he had showered down upon them. And you may not live in exactly the same situation that those Thessalonians did, but you live in a constantly changing world. And with many of the same kinds of problems, and in some ways, maybe even worse problems than they face. But you can live with confidence, because you're sure of the fact. And you know the blessings that God has given to you. You thank God for them, even as I do. And for you, too, are among the elect, those God chose to be his from eternity. Brought to faith in Jesus through the preaching of the gospel so you can face your days with confidence 
as you know him, and that he will never, never let you down. You have lots to be thankful for. And their church that over the past years has grown in, in so many ways, for a school that has grown. You know, when I, when I moved to Florida, let's see, this is 18, that would be 11 years ago. The school here was pretty small. I had the staff of two, two. One of those is still teaching here, for which we're thankful for. But the staff has grown in so many ways. You have a principal. I know last spring there were those who wondered, how are we going to replace the principal? What's going to happen? We got so many schools that are looking for principals. We were reminded of that again in our conference this week, that they've, they've really called people out of retirement. They've really worked hard to try and get some. I know one of my sons, uh, five days before the school year started, his principal said, I need a leave of absence. What do you do? Well, he's, he's serving part of the principal's duties, besides serving as the pastor there. But God has blessed you. Be thankful for that. The school has grown in so many ways. You can face the future of your days with confidence. Not only face them with confidence, but also be joyful in the present. <clears throat> Paul addressed these Christians as the church of God, in the church of the Thessalonians, in God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. He reminded them they were the church of God the Father. When they were brought to faith, in Jesus as their Savior, they were adopted into God's family as his own dear children. And so were you when you were brought to faith. For some of you, that was the day when you were baptized. Some of you at this very font here. At that day, God adopted you and said, you're my own dear children. Your baptismal certificate we could say is your letter of adoption, your certificate of adoption. It says, God says, you're my own dear child. And there's no greater blessing than that. You know, let's think of it. When, when you were children, or for those who are children now, perhaps there were others that you knew. Maybe they had parents who gave them everything. And you maybe looked at them and said, wouldn't it be great if I was their child? And you've got a greater father than those people do. You've got the Heavenly Father, who is the most wise, the most powerful, the most loving, the most kind that there could ever be. He loves you, and He cares about you, and He gives you what you need daily. Grace and peace to you. That's what God gives you. His undeserved love. He doesn't say, yeah, you sinned, so I don't want I don't want to see you. He forgives you day in and day out. And when he forgives your sins, takes care of that worst problem of all. You can have peace. You don't need to be afraid that all of a sudden God's going to come out and say, I got you! And you're going to pay for it. No. In His grace, in His amazing love, He protects you and cares for you. He protects you especially from Satan and his power. He protects you from the fear of death. A lot of people are terrified by the thought of death. We don't have to be. Because we know that death is kind of like a door, isn't it? There's here on this side of the door, but on the other side of the door, when that door opens, there's God in heaven for us. 
with so much more blessings than we have here. What blessed peace we have. You know, that's one thing the world looks for, but it can't find. No wonder we have people who try all these illegal drugs, try to use them to get themselves high, to forget the things of this world, because they don't have peace. You have peace. Peace with God. What a wonderful assurance that is. Even if the doctor gave you some horrible report, you face the days with confidence because you know that your Heavenly Father is not going to let anything happen to you that will really harm you, that will separate you from Him. That's what grace and peace do. And so now, whenever you face the future, you know the moment that those phone calls come, or whether it's blessings that come, you face the future with joy. Because after all, you're a child of God, an heir of eternal life, and it can't get any better than that. So Christians face the future with confidence, grateful for blessings received, and joyful in the present. Is that it? No. I hope not. As St. Paul urges, face the future with confidence, eager to serve. Paul mentions three things in particular that he is thankful for among those, with those Christians in Thessalonica who were active and eager to serve. He noted, your work produced by faith, your labor prompted by love, and your endurance inspired by hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. Do you notice three things there? Sometimes called the three cardinal Christian virtues? Faith, hope, what's the other one? Love, love yeah. Those three things, faith, hope, and love. He spoke about their work produced by faith. Now, it's certainly true that we're saved by faith apart from works. But faith, funny thing about it, it's never alone. It always produces works. It receives the wonderful blessings that God gives and says, how can I thank him for these? And it serves doing things whether it's the Christian example one seeks to set, the word of witness when the opportunity arises, the greeting of visitors at church, the willingness to pitch into help in a project, even with physical labor, or in some other way, faith finds a way to serve. And then there's love. Did you ever see someone who proclaims to love another and never does anything for them? never shows it? Is that love? I don't think so. Love always finds a way to show itself, doesn't it? In one way or another. Perhaps in many, many different ways. A um, person would be hard-pressed to say that one who never does anything is showing love. St. Paul spoke about that too. And, and with, the, with the words that he used, uh, he talks about for example, you've heard of people who have hands that are well worn, maybe calloused, whatnot, well worn from their works of service. And the word that he uses there is labor. The labor is basically bone wearying labor. Christians are willing to serve, even when they're tired, even when it hurts, even when it makes shows. They don't ask, did I show you enough love? We look at Jesus and think of him and the labor that he went to for you and for me. Did he stop and say, well, I've gone this far, that's enough, huh? He went all the way to the cross, gave himself for you and me because he loved us. There was no stopping 
until our sins were paid in full, each and every one of them. Love labors on as best it can, eager to serve. And then there's hope. St. Paul wrote, endurance inspired by hope. It's steadfast in hope. You know, those Christians in Thessalonica suffered horrible persecution. They kept on going. And remember, Paul even wondered if there were any of them left. But the believers were not only holding on in the midst of persecution, they were pressing forward. Their love and faith led them to share the good news of Jesus' love for them. They became, as Paul wrote just a few verses later, he wrote there, a model to all the believers in Macedonia, which was their home province, and in Achaia, which was the other province of Greece. And again, a few verses after that, he says, the Lord's message rang out from you, not only in Macedonia and Achaia, your faith in God has become known everywhere. Isn't that amazing? The nerve got around how these people held on. They were eager to serve. Now what about us? Now some of you, of course, are tied down with jobs and various responsibilities, right? Okay. Others are limited physically, in one way or another. But you can still be eager to serve in whatever capacity there may be. That doesn't mean we expect anybody to do everything. No. There shouldn't be anyone who does everything, including this guy right here, the pastor. But everybody can do something. Everything. We can eagerly serve the Lord by showing our love, letting your deeds of faith flow. Even if it only be earnest prayer. Did I say only? How important that earnest prayer is. Prayer for God's work, for the spread of the gospel in our area and elsewhere. And certainly you can show your love as you patiently endure whatever comes your way. And there will be opportunities to help as the renovation proceeds, right? I'm sure there will be opportunities, right? Things for people to do. Maybe it will come to helping to move the pews out when that time comes, or whatever, maybe tearing up the carpet. There's always going to be something that maybe you can help with. The proposed preschool, certainly there's things that can be done to help with prepare for that too. Remember, Christians face the future with confidence. Right? Not fear and trouble, but with confidence. Grateful for blessings received. Joyful in the present and eager to serve. As you do so, you can be sure that God will also bless. You are sure of that, right? If you're sure of that, then say, Amen. 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 And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, since as members of one body, you were called to peace and be thankful. Amen.